Meanwhile, I began writing a series of Sunday feature page editorials which were published in the Canton Daily News based upon the law of success philosophy. One of these editorials, the one entitled Failure, which appears in the back of one of the lessons of this course, came to the attention of Judge Albert H. Gary, who was at that time the chairman of the board of the United States Steel Corporation. This resulted in the opening of communication between Mellet and Judge Gary, which in turn led to Judge Gary's offer to purchase the Law of Success course for the use of the employees of the Steel Corporation in the manner described in the introductory lesson. The tides of fortune had begun to turn in my favor. The seeds of service, which I had been sowing over a long period of toilsome years by doing more than paid for, were beginning to germinate at last. Despite the fact that my partner was assassinated before our plans had much more than started, and Judge Gary died before the law of success philosophy could be rewritten so it conformed to his requirements, the love's labor lost on that fateful night when I spoke to an audience of thirteen in Canton, Ohio, started a chain of events which now move rapidly without thought or effort on my part. It is no abuse of confidence to enumerate here a few of the events which show that no labor of love is ever performed at a total loss and that those who render more service and better service than that for which they are paid, sooner or later receive pay for much more than they actually do. As this lesson is ready to go to the publisher, some of the following well-known concerns are considering favorably the purchase of the Law of Success course for all their employees, while others have actually arranged for the purchase of the course. Mr. Daniel Willard, President of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company. Indian Refining Company, Standard Oil Company, New York Life Insurance Company, the Postal Telegraph Commercial Cable Company, the Pierce Arrow Motor Car Company, the Cadillac Motor Car Company, and some fifty other concerns of a similar size. In addition to this, a newly organized club for boys, similar in nature to the YMCA, has contracted for the use of the Law of Success course as the basis of its educational program and estimates that it will distribute more than 100,000 courses of the philosophy within the next two years. Quite aside from these sources of distribution, the Ralston University Press of Meriden, Connecticut, has contracted to publish and distribute the course to individuals throughout the United States, and perhaps in some foreign countries. How many courses they will distribute cannot be accurately estimated, but when one stops to consider the fact that they have a mailing list of approximately 800,000 people, who have faith in anything they offer for sale, it seems very reasonable to suppose that their distribution will place tens of thousands of courses in the hands of men and women who are earnestly searching for the knowledge conveyed by the law of success philosophy. Perhaps it is unnecessary, but I wish to explain that my only object in here relating the story of how the law of success philosophy has gained the recognition described is to show how the law upon which this lesson is based actually works out in the practical affairs of life. If I could have made this analysis without the use of the personal pronoun, I would have done so. Among the other things you intend to cut out in your New Year's resolution include the word impossible. There is no more dangerous person, dangerous to himself and to others, than the person who passes judgment without pretending to know the facts. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. With this background of history concerning the law of success philosophy as a whole, and this lesson in particular, you are better prepared to accept as sound the law on which this lesson is based. There are more than a score of sound reasons why you should develop the habit of performing more service and better service than that for which you are paid, despite the fact that a large majority of the people are not rendering such service. There are two reasons, however, for rendering such service which transcend in importance all the others. Namely, first, by establishing a reputation as being a person who always renders more service and better service than that for which you are paid you will benefit by comparison with those around you who do not render such service, and the contrast will be so noticeable that there will be keen competition for your services, no matter what your life work may be. It would be an insult to your intelligence to offer proof of the soundness of this statement, because it is obviously sound. Whether you are preaching sermons, practicing law, writing books, teaching school, or digging ditches, you will become more valuable 
and you will be able to command greater pay the minute you gain recognition as a person who does more than that for which he is paid. Second, by far the most important reason why you should render more service than that for which you are paid, a reason that is basic and fundamental in nature, may be described in this way. Suppose that you wished to develop a strong right arm, and suppose that you tried to do so by tying the arm to your side with a rope, thus taking it out of use and giving it a long rest. Would disuse bring strength, or would it bring atrophy and weakness, resulting finally in your being compelled to have the arm removed? You know that if you wished a strong right arm, you could develop such an arm only by giving it the hardest sort of use. Take a look at the arm of a blacksmith if you wish to know how an arm may be made strong. Out of resistance comes strength. The strongest oak tree of the forest is not the one that is protected from the storm and hidden from the sun, but it is the one that stands in the open, where it is compelled to struggle for its existence against the winds and rains and the scorching sun. It is through the operation of one of nature's unvarying laws that struggle and resistance develop strength. And the purpose of this lesson is to show you how to harness this law, and so use it that it will aid you in your struggle for success. By performing more service and better service than that for which you are paid, you not only exercise your service-rendering qualities, and thereby develop skill and ability of an extraordinary sort, but you build reputation that is valuable. If you form the habit of rendering such service, you will become so adept in your work that you can command greater remuneration than those who do not perform such service. You will eventually develop sufficient strength to enable you to remove yourself from any undesirable station in life, and no one can or will desire to stop you. If you are an employee, you can make yourself so valuable through this habit of performing more service than that for which you are paid that you can practically set your own wages and no sensible employer will try to stop you. If your employer should be so unfortunate as to try to withhold from you the compensation to which you are entitled, this will not long remain as a handicap because other employers will discover this unusual quality and offer you employment. The very fact that most people are rendering as little service as they can possibly get by with serves as an advantage to all who are rendering more service than that for which they are paid, because it enables all who do this to profit by comparison. You can get by if you render as little service as possible, but that is all you will get. And when work is slack and retrenchment sets in, you will be one of the first to be dismissed. For more than twenty-five years I have carefully studied men with the object of ascertaining why some achieve noteworthy success, while others with just as much ability do not get ahead and it seems significant that every person whom I have observed applying this principle of rendering more service than that for which he was paid was holding a better position and receiving more pay than those who merely performed sufficient service to get by with. Personally, I never received a promotion in my life that I could not trace directly to recognition that I had gained by rendering more service and better service than that for which I was paid. I am stressing the importance of making this principle a habit as a means of enabling an employee to promote himself to a higher position, with greater pay, for the reason that this course will be studied by thousands of young men and young women who work for others. However, the principle applies to the employer or to the professional man or woman just the same as to the employee. Observance of this principle brings a twofold reward. First, it brings the reward of greater material gain than that enjoyed by those who do not observe it. And second, it brings that reward of happiness and satisfaction which come only to those who render such service. If you receive no pay except that which comes in your pay envelope, you are underpaid, no matter how much money that envelope contains.